The discovery is completely unique. We have terracotta servants who could serve him. They also find the head of the terracotta warriors. And they, the team, our classical team, came to this area and they start to uh, dig. For more than two millennia, the terracotta army meant to rule beyond death serve as protection for Qin Shi Huang, the first Chinese emperor. This is an emperor who's obsessed with rediscovering lost knowledge. His ambition is to become, in life, like the goal. But in 2025, his silent clay army was scanned by state-of-the-art AI technology, and the results shocked historians. Worldwide, beneath the surface, there were elements that could fundamentally alter our perception of his rule, his power, and his concept of immortality. The underground army of Qin Shang. In the early spring of 1974, drought was beginning to destroy the dry farmlands close to the northern Chinese city of Xi'an. The emperor conquered six kingdoms and unified China for the first time in history. A few Xiang peasants decided to dig a fresh well in an effort to find water. Among them was a farmer named Yang Jifa. As he pushed through the pale earth, his shovel struck a hard item around 15 feet down. At first, he thought it might be an old roof tile or shattered china. Then a human-sized clay skull rolled out of the pit. Other artifacts that followed were a torso, fragments of armor, and bronze arrowheads glittering in the dust. None of them could have imagined that they had just cut through the roof of one of the world's most magnificent archaeological sites. Buried was an army that had been undisturbed for more than two millennia. The farmers gathered some of the bronze arrowheads and put them near the edge of the field to sell for a few pence. The finding may have stopped there if Zhao Kong Man, a local cultural official, hadn't heard about strange statues around the well. He immediately recognized the clay figures as something unique when he drove out to inspect. Jiao began collecting every fragment he could find after notifying the Shur Provincial Archaeological Institute. In just a few months, excavation teams came, and the scope of what they found forced China to construct an entire museum complex on top of the dig. The extra structures would shield the site from the rain and the growing number of visitors. We're at the center, at the heart of this unbelievable world heritage site. When it was clear enough to see, the first pit seemed like a silent war trapped in time. The row that follows. A line of life-size clay soldiers stood in position, their heads held high and their armor expertly made, as if they were waiting for a command that would never come. They faced east, the direction of the rival kingdoms that China's first emperor had conquered in the 3rd century BC, and behind them stood clay horses that had once drawn wooden war chariots. The chariot wood had long since deteriorated, but the ruts on the floor still revealed where the wheels had rested. The scope was unfathomable. Current estimates indicate that there were about 8,000 soldiers, over 100 chariots, and hundreds of horses dispersed over several underground pits. Only a piece has been excavated. The largest room, Pit 1, is around 755 feet long and a little broader than 200 feet. With a floor area of 153,000 feet, or more than two full fields or three and a half acres, it is around 100 feet long and somewhat wider than 100 feet. 16 feet below the original ground, the soldiers are positioned. Pit 1 is only the beginning. Imagine a vast underground hall with long aisles separated by massive mud walls. Archaeologists identify 11 parallel tunnels that go from east to west. They used to have massive wooden beams for their ceilings, which were covered in layers of packed clay and reed mats to keep water out. In its initial state, Pit 1 would have felt like a covered staging area ready for deployment. At the eastern end is a vanguard line of soldiers known as the front attackers. Columns of armored infantry in the center behind them hold long weapons. Troops turn forth along the sides and return to defend the flanks. It is set up similarly to how a real army prepares for combat. Pit 1 is the main demonstration of strength, whereas Pit 2 shows strategy. It is nearby and has the appropriate combined arms layout. All types of troops were formed to work together. Excavators found standing saddled horses, chariot crews positioned from their horse-drawn carts as if ready for battle, and cavalry units with kneeling archers caught in mid-draw. Pit 2 includes several hundred combatants, around a hundred horses, 
in numerous chariots that are divided into distinct parts, like the wings of an army in battle, according to current tallies. Some of the kneeling archers still had paint residue on their shoes and armor when they were first discovered. Pit 3, which is smaller at about 5,600 square feet, can hold much fewer figures but serves a special purpose. With only a few dozen officers and a single chariot drawn by four horses, it is arranged like a command post. Scholars claim that this area functioned as the army's headquarters, with senior commanders in charge of the soldiers positioned in the larger pits. Pit 4 was later discovered to be empty in an unfinished chamber, suggesting that the project might have been in progress when it was closed. Compared to the previous pits, Pit 3 has less fire damage, and some of its hues are still very vivid. Because of its preservation, it offers the most realistic picture of how the entire army once looked in vivid color. Even after 50 years of exploration, the complex is still full of surprises. Archaeologists excavating in Pit 2 in late 2024 and early 2025 found an extremely elaborate officer figure, a life-size senior commander standing among two chariots and several horses. His elaborate carved armor and lofty, elaborate headpiece serve as indicators of his nobility. Chinese scholars claim that such high-status individuals are extremely rare. Only about 10 top-tier commanders have been identified since 1974. The process by which these data were produced is equally astounding as their quantity. Each fighter is between 5 and 6 feet tall and weighs several hundred pounds. They are empty despite their might. The legs were like thick clay tubes. The torsos were built separately as large shells. While the clay was still wet, heads, hands, and arms were created individually and then assembled. Seams were straightened, facial features were sculpted, and fine details were pushed into the surface. Even fingernails, belt knots, and armor plate stitching were done by hand. Analysis revealed that the clay was greater than ordinary dirt. Under a microscope, Researchers found a variety of minerals, such as quartz and kaolin with local loss, a fine yellow silt typical of northern China. Lois easily compacts and dries to a hard finish. Quartz adds grit and strength, while kaolin adds suppleness and smoothness. After the mix was carefully prepared, perhaps in central facilities near the venue, production staff sculpted and assembled the figures. Instead of producing a single gifted sculpture in the 3rd century BC, a state-run industrial enterprise developed. The vestiges of that system still exist. When certain features like the basic shapes of hands or heads are repeated, it is clear that molds were used for standardized pieces. But once each molded piece was made, an artist would modify it. Because of such hand-finished touches, no two warriors are exactly alike. When you stand in front of these individuals, you can see how different their jawlines, cheekbones, ears, hairlines, and even moods are. Some faces seem calm, while others seem anxious, and some noses are straight, while others are crooked. There are even lines pressed in a lips that look like healed scars. To ascertain if such diversity is based on real people or just artistic taste, researchers have employed machine learning and high-resolution 3D scanning. By comparing thousands of minuscule factors, such as ear angle, chin depth, or the way one eyelid folds, an AI algorithm searches for patterns that a human eye could miss. Teams that conducted detailed scans of warrior heads found that the ear shapes and facial asymmetry are so unique that it is hard to believe they were made from scratch. According to the working assumption, at least some of the higher ranking officials, especially officers, may have taken inspiration from actual individuals who served under the first emperor. Variations in armor and clothing can serve as indicators of rank and responsibility. Senior officers wear thick, layered breastplates and towering, elaborate headgear. Chariot drivers are built with sturdy stances and protective headgear to withstand rain. Cavalry troopers wear shorter, tighter coats designed for riding while kneeling archers wear light armor that allows them to twist and fire. There is a military purpose associated with each position. The gray and brown colors that are seen now are what remained after paint and lacquer degraded. When excavators first pulled figures from the ground in the 1970s, 
they found that the surfaces were still coated in vibrant colors. Rich reds from cinnabar, black hairlines, vivid blues and purples from copper-based minerals, and even decorative designs painted on armor lacing. Among the pigments discovered was Chinese purple, also known as Han purple and a synthetic barium copper silicate. It was among the earliest purple pigments ever made artificially. These hues were covered with a thin layer of lacquer, a natural glue made from the sap of the Asian lacquer tree. When lacquer is applied and dried, it produces a glossy, glass-like seal that looks like translucent varnish. To create a smooth, moisture-resistant surface, artists then lacquered the clay figures before applying the vivid pigments. Although the idea was perfect in antiquity, modern archaeologists found it to be terrible. When the old lacquer came into touch with air, it dried and shriveled, causing the paint to flake off almost instantly. Vibrant colors vanished before their eyes in the early excavations, frequently in as little as 15 seconds, as scientists watched helplessly. In just a few minutes, entire pigment layers would dissolve. Crews were forced to stop excavation and use chemical stabilizers to preserve any residual color. Conservators now apply those treatments as soon as new surfaces are found to prevent the last traces of paint from disappearing. The weapons carried by the soldiers complete the concept of a full battle force. The clay figurines used to carry over 40,000 bronze weapons, including swords, long spears, lances, halberds, dagger axes, crossbow gears, and countless arrowheads. Bronze, an alloy of copper and tin, was the most valuable material available at the period. The halberd, a pole weapon with a projecting blade, allowed soldiers to stab or hook opponents from a distance. Archaeologists found bundles of carefully packed arrowheads in clusters of about 100. Chemical research revealed that each bundle's composition was consistent within itself, but somewhat varied from the bundle next to it. Beyond the major troop chambers, archaeologists have discovered a network of interconnected pits scattered around the same field. Through hundreds of digs, they have discovered metal chariots buried with real horses, pits containing suits of stone armor, and groups of clay officials and attendants. One pit even features performers, acrobats, and strongmen in motion, while another recreates a tranquil garden scene with bronze ducks, cranes, and swans surrounding what was once a stream bed accompanied by musicians. These findings demonstrate that, rather than being only a military display, the site was meant to be a miniature representation of the emperor's realm, complete with performers, animals, and people. If this is the army, what or who are they defending? Beneath a massive mound that may be the deadliest tomb ever built sits the solution. Inside the forbidden tomb of the first emperor, situated in the center of the entire site, is a gigantic earth pyramid that looks tranquil from a distance, but is frightening when you learn what lies beneath it. He was buried in a tomb beneath a huge mound in the middle of the site. The 249-foot-tall mound, roughly the height of a 20-story building, seals the underground grave of China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang. Its base stretches hundreds of feet in all directions, forming a wide, flat-top pyramid surrounded by defensive walls and the remains of an earlier gate. According to historical accounts and current research, work on this burial project began when Qin Shi Huang was still a young man and continued for almost 40 years, from roughly 246 BC to 208 BC. Up to 700,000 people, laborers, craftspeople, and prisoners were forced to dig, move, and build the enormous underground complex and the enormous mound that separated it from the outer world, according to historical accounts. Archaeologists have linked the workers who built the complex to mass burials found during excavations west of the main mausoleum area. One grave site contained more than 100 skeletons. Most of them were young or middle-aged men. Many of them were between the ages of 15 and 40. There is extreme physical strain on their bones. Research on ancient DNA and skull shape suggests that these workers may not have originated from a single hometown. Others had traits unrelated to the Shansha region. Others were from the north, and some were from far to the south. After the project was finished, Numerous workers and even some palace women were reportedly killed or buried nearby, 
to keep them from disclosing what had been built. Instead of being a single room, surveys and scans show that the underground palace is a large walled compound hidden beneath. Inside is a 13-foot tall perimeter wall made of brick. Its inner rectangle measures roughly 1,280 feet from east to west and 1, 59 feet from north to south. A shell composed of a second wall of packed earth, thick outside the brickwork and 30 to 40 yards tall, encloses the core-like armor. Sloping tunnels lead down to the center from either side. At the heart of it all is the main burial chamber, which is around 262 feet long, 164 feet broad, and nearly 50 feet high. Its ceiling is currently about 100 feet below the Earth's surface. Additionally, there have been signs of sewers and what looks to be an underground dam, proof of the builder's flood protection strategies. There was nothing like this grave. It was constructed like a fort. This site is special since the core burial chamber has never been discovered. The actual tomb of Qin Shu Huang, which is said to hold his body and wealth, is still sealed as it was nearly two millennia ago. Archaeologists have carried out excavations all around it, finding what appear to be the remnants of palace foundations around the mound, as well as horse holes and chariot pits. Officials, musicians, and the outlines of entire courtyard structures arranged like the capital city of the emperor's afterlife have been found. But the entrance to the core chamber has never been breached. All of our knowledge of what is beneath the hill comes from ancient records, ground-penetrating scans, and chemical assessments of the surrounding soil and air. About a century after the emperor's death in 210 BC, the historian Samakian wrote the first known account of the tomb in the first century BC. He said that the underground chamber might contain large buildings, castles, and towers full of priceless artifacts and riches. He said that the kingdom was reproduced in miniature by rivers and oceans formed by liquid mercury flowing inside the tomb. He said that the ceiling was painted with constellations and the stars of the night sky, while the floor below showed the mountains and valleys of China. He described mechanical defenses, crossbows that could shoot intruders automatically, and lights made from the fat of a strange marine creature he called a manfish, possibly a whale, that burned continuously. For centuries, scholars debated whether any of the material was true or just fiction. However, disturbing evidence supporting Simon's assertions is still being discovered by modern research. One of the most unsettling things about this place is the mercury. Toxic vapor is generated as mercury evaporates. At room temperature, mercury, a silvery liquid metal, stays fluid. Contemporary readings have confirmed Simeon's claim that the tomb contains rivers and seas of mercury, and the results are unervingly accurate. The soil around the mound has been found to have far greater levels of mercury than is usual for the area. Certain samples of the mud had mercury amounts of about 1,440 parts per billion, and further research revealed hot spots with quantities higher than 1,200 parts per billion. The first emperor passed away more over 2,000 years ago. However, his secrets continue to reverberate underground. If the contents of that locked tomb are even remotely as remarkable as the stories portray, the tale of Qin Shi Huang, the man who yearned for immortality, may therefore only be getting started rather than coming to a conclusion. Perhaps one day, when technology dares to open those prohibited doors, we'll finally discover what the world's been waiting for. Until then, the Terracotta Army remains silent, unchanging, and vigilant.